Hello, welcome everyone. We have some people floating in. Welcome. Welcome everyone. Uh, we're gonna give everyone a couple minutes to kind of get in, um, but for those that are already here, uh, please feel free to put in your business, introduce yourself into the chat feature. Um, and then in line with this webinar, your website, um, kind of like to uh, introduce who you guys are, your Instagram handles, uh, right in that chat feature. Okay, now I turned on the chat feature. So now everyone can go ahead and introduce themselves um, into that chat feature. Okay, now, now it's working. <laughs> um, yeah, so please go ahead and introduce yourself, uh, throw in your business at, um, business website in that chat feature, um, and we'll start in a minute or two. I see we have some members hopping on too. Uh, some from Twee makes really great chalk. Um, a few folks from Twee. Cool. All right. So I know we had a ton of questions around this. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with our um, SEO webinar. As people filter in, please continue to introduce yourself in that chat feature. Um, put in your website, uh, etc. Uh, but without further ado, um, I am Rebecca Ledbetter. I'm our Director of Marketing here at NextFab. Uh, NextFab is um, a series of membership-based uh, makerspaces here in Philly and Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, and we're going to be talking about everyone's favorite topic, SEO. Uh, with us today, uh, we have uh, Adam Gingry. Um, I mispronounced it. <laughs> Hello, Adam. <laughs> uh, he's going to actually share he has a ton of knowledge about SEO. Um, I'm going to go ahead and have you introduce yourself, and then we're just going to dive in. Um, but oh, before we do that, I just want to really quickly uh, let you guys know about the features we will be using today. Um, I can see you guys are still uh, chatting away in the chat feature. Feel free to add in any questions you have throughout the end of, uh, throughout this webinar. We're going to save a good 30, 40 minutes at the end for your individual questions. Uh, we also have that Q&A feature. Um, add your questions there too. Like I said, uh, we're going to have plenty of time at the end for those really specific questions, really broad questions, whatever you guys are wondering about SEO website, um, Adam's going to be answering at the end. Uh, we're answering about 20, 30 minutes on Adam's presentation. Um, and this will be recorded. Uh, Adam is going to be sharing out his presentation as well. Uh, all that's going to be coming to you guys tomorrow. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic to Adam to introduce himself and get started. Hey everybody, I'm Adam. Thanks for giving me a few minutes to uh, chat with you all. It's always nice to uh, talk to local folks. Um, I am a partner at a marketing agency in Old City called Magix. Um, I also own the Philadelphia Piano Institute with my wife, Erica. Uh, we have two locations, one in Queen Village and one in Bella Vista. And I do a lot of consulting and other stuff. But anyways, SEO is a big part of my life. Uh, it's done a lot for me and my businesses, so I'm happy to share. Um, I'm going to take us through maybe a 20 minute long kind of talk about the basics of SEO. Uh, if my slides are ever not 
working, Rebecca, just let me know. Yep. And um, if we ever need to pause to answer some questions along the way, that's totally fine. But uh, this might answer some of your questions before we get there. So we'll see. But yeah, let's uh, jump right in and um, keep track of your questions. We'll talk about them. So first of all, obviously, what is SEO? Um, it's just the exercise of communicating to Google and other search engines what's on your website um, and your other web properties and being found online when people are searching for things. There's a definition here. It's not all Google. Uh, YouTube is a search engine too. People do use DuckDuckGo, but you can kind of ignore the other search engines. It's mostly Google and YouTube. Um, what does it look like when you're successful in SEO? Um, you probably wanna rank here in the top of the Google map pack. That's its own algorithm that we'll talk about later. This is our piano business. And then the traditional SERPs down here at the bottom of this screenshot, you can see the Philadelphia Piano Institute is also number one and the list of 10 websites. That's like the original search engine before the map pack was introduced. Um, as far as if this is really gonna work for you or not, that's contingent upon a few things. Uh, one, is this actually, do you have a product or a service that people are looking for already? Um, search engine optimization is not the best strategy for, I guess what we would call demand generation. You know, if people don't already know they want your thing, this would be a little bit more of an abstract process for you. But if you sell something that people are looking for online, you would want to be competing for that real estate in search engines to be found. Um, I have an example here, custom cabinetry near me. That's something that people are literally Googling every day and you would wanna be found in the Google map pack or in the traditional SERPs. There are lots of other services that get search volume. Um, I heard we have some people here maybe who are making guitars or restoring pianos. Uh, obviously it's music, so it's on my mind, but there are a lot of services that people are Googling and you'd wanna compete for that. Also, it doesn't have to be local, you know? Um, another example here, um, that's on the next slide. Here's an example from NextFab, Mini Alley. Um, I'm sure you all know this business. I just found it yesterday while I was preparing for this. I think it's unbelievably cool, but um, it's not local. You know, People aren't Googling bookshelf inserts in Philadelphia, but it would still benefit from SEO because you can optimize a website and have content that can rank when people Google these things and they would be qualified to buy your product. Um, also, if you have something that nobody knows they want, right? But there is an established audience, like niche blogs for that audience, you can still be successful with SEO. Uh, an example is somebody emailed me recently who patented a product for the, uh, the um, concrete construction industry. And he was like, how can we market this with SEO? And I was like, well, obviously no one's looking for this because they don't know it exists. But there are a lot of people out there, you know, Googling how to pour concrete better, how to level concrete better, how to get concrete jobs, you know, whatever. I don't know. You could have a website and write 100 blogs about this. And over time with SEO, you can get an audience of people reading your content and then you upsell them to your product. An interesting little tie in here is I went back and watched that Kickstarter video, um, which I thought was very cool. And this is an opportunity where if you actually built a little bit of a community or audience through your website and the same applies to social media, of course. Um, you know, you could have a pop-up on your blogs. It's like, hey, we have a new product launching. Get involved with our Kickstarter. There are cross-sell opportunities here and it's kind of called audience-based marketing. Um, it's kind of the new hip thing. And you can do that with SEO even if people don't know your product exists. Um, here's some examples of how many people are looking for this stuff. Uh, I just plugged these keywords into the Google Keyword Planner tool to see how much volume there is. I was shocked at how many people are Googling laser cutting services. <laughs> I don't even really know what that is exactly, but I saw it on the next web website. So here we are. Um, if you have a service or a product that you think people are searching for, you can plug it into the Google Keyword Planner. You can use tools um, like Answer the Public or just Google Keyword Research Tools and you'll find them and you can kind of see what to go for. But this proves there's a, there's a reason you would want to be ranking at Google for these things because people are searching for it. And that's a free tool, right? That Google keyword tool. Yes, you need to sign up for a Google, Google Ads account with your Gmail, but 
it's free. Yep. Um, and also there, seriously, there are hundreds of keyword planner tools that you can find. Answer the public is a good one. Um, but if you just search for that, there's probably a new one that was launched yesterday. That's awesome. So if you want to start doing keyword research, just Google keyword research tool and you'll find a whole bunch of free ones that are great as well. That's just the one that I use every day. Um, those are all things that people will be searching for locally, nationally. We already looked at the bookshelf insert thing. Um, that's a lot of people looking for that. It doesn't have to be targeted locally. Um, all right, so moving on to the five facets of SEO. We already talked about the map pack. That's one. If you have a local shop or a local service, that's going to be very important for you. You might even get most of your business from there. Um, the traditional search engine results, people actually do still click on them, even though you have to scroll past the ads, you have to scroll past the map pack, sometimes other stuff. People still will research all the way down to look at that list of websites. And if you're in the top five or top three, there's a lot of built-in authority there. People will think you're the best option, even if it's just you have someone behind the scenes manipulating Google's algorithm to get you there. There's a built-in level of authority there. Um, for makers, I personally think image SEO matters. Um, if people are Googling piano lessons, they're not gonna open the image tab, they don't care. Um, they wanna read like how much does it cost, you know, like where are the teachers, stuff like that. But if you're selling, you know, tables, you might get someone who Googles, you know, custom tables in Philadelphia and they'll just open up the image tab to see who has the nicest looking tables. So to do that on your website, you just need to have lots of good images um, and you need to optimize those images. There's a code tag in an image. It's called the alt tag. Um, and that's intended for visually impaired people so that they can be read to what the image is about if they can't see the screen. But Google actually crawls the text in the alt text tag on an image to see what the image is about. And then it can rank that in that um, image page. So you'd want to think about that. Google Shopping. Um, I think I actually have here, this is image search, by the way. There are ads on the top, so you can ignore those. But down here, you have the Philadelphia Table Company. They know what they're doing. They have some really great, great pictures with alt text in there. So I would recommend doing that. Shopping is a little bit of a different beast. Now, if you just have a service where everything is custom, this might not be a great fit for you. But let's say you make you know, coffee tables, just back to the table example and you have an e-commerce website, you could have, you have to have a Google Merchant Center account, which is free, just Google Google Merchant Center and set up an account. And then you have to have a shopping feed, which let's say you have a Shopify website or a WordPress website or a Squarespace website and you have e-commerce enabled, meaning people can actually click onto a product page and then buy it. You can automatically hook those up to Google Merchant Center and then when you Google something and click the shopping tab, you're actually, your placement can show for free. You don't have to run shopping ads. You can actually just have your products show for free. And that's very important because it shows the price, a good image, it can show reviews. And that's, people will very often just bypass the first page, the regular search engine results totally to get to shopping results. Um, I think I also mentioned video here. I did, so let's go to that video image. This is happening a lot these days. If you Google some kind of an informa informational query, um, you're gonna see video listings. And basically we're gonna talk about how you can choose blog posts in a few minutes here. When you do that blog research and write a blog post, which you would need to rank on Google, you can just make a video about that same subject matter. You can use your blog as a transcript record a video, and then embed that video on that corresponding page on your website so that when someone Googles something like how to design your living room, you're going to show up on the first page of Google in this video list. You know, after, over time, as you accumulate authority in your space, you're eligible to show here. So your website could have a video showing here. You could show in the Google Map Pack, and you could show in those traditional 10 website results. So there's a lot of real estate to go after by thinking about these different areas. So how do you actually do this? Um, the first most important thing is your website. Uh, invest in a good website at the beginning because you don't wanna have to redo it as you grow. Um, it'll hold you back. It has to be very fast. 
Um, that's actually a ranking factor. Like it's in the algorithm. If your website is slow, it won't rank as well as a fast website, all other things being equal. Has to be mobile friendly. Obviously, every website builder is now. It's hard not to have a mobile friendly website. Good site structure. What that means is, first of all, have a different page for every service you offer or every product you offer. Um, back to piano technician and restoration. Let's say you do all that stuff and you just have a one page website that says, I tune pianos, I restore pianos, and I sell used pianos. Well, you're really holding yourself back because you'd want to have one page for piano tuning with lots of content about piano tuning. One page for piano restoration services, lots of content about that. And then another page about um, pianos for sale in your city. You know, That's how Google can digest what's happening on your website and decide what page needs to rank for what. Internal links. This one's really important and it's confusing. So here's an example. Um, you're going to need blog posts that are industry specific on your website. And that's because the more relevant content you have on your website about your area of expertise, the more Google views your site as an authority in the subject. But in those blog posts, you have to link up to your, uh, what I call money pages, right? So back to piano tuning again. Let's say you want your page to rank for piano tuners in Philadelphia. Well, you need to have a blog post about how often should you tune your piano, for instance. In there, have a link up to your piano tuning page with the anchor text, Piano Tuners Philadelphia or something. I was trying to rank our website for piano lessons, um, which we do. So in this blog post about Simply Piano, you can see that link that I circled. That links to our page that ranks for piano lessons with the anchor text, Piano Lessons. That's just what internal linking is. Um, do this in a purposeful way to pages that make sense, and it'll help your website rank better over time. Back to optimized for conversion. That just means, does it make sense to a user? You know, if you're an e-commerce website, um, do you have an add to cart you know, button? Are you trying to get leads for a service you offer on uh, above the fold without someone having to scroll, have a button for get in touch or sign up or call or something like that, you know, simple stuff. For the images, we already talked about this. It's important to rank in image search if you are selling, you know, goods, right? Um, but you need to optimize that alt text, which is an easily accessible feature in pretty much every website builder now. And you want your file name for the image to make sense. Um, lots of content. Google loves content. You don't have to keyword stuff it. That was something that people did in like 2005 for SEO. Google is smarter than that now. <laughs> so if you're actually an expert in your field of expertise, you can write 700 words about it. And you don't have to think too much about the keywords because the important words are gonna be there if you know what you're talking about. But in those pages, you need to have, you know, optimize it for readability on the web. People skim, they don't read every word anymore. So have titles, have subtitles, put keywords in your titles, and that'll help you rank better on Google. Um, this last thing, page titles and header tags with keywords, that's a little bit of a technical SEO thing. The user doesn't necessarily see that when they're on the website. But if you Google, you know, um, well, Piano Lessons Philadelphia, and you see the first result is Philadelphia Piano Institute with the keyword Piano Lessons Philadelphia in the title, that's something that you have to optimize in your website's code. And that tells Google what the page is about and helps it rank better. Backlinks. This is the hardest part of SEO probably and the most misunderstood. Um, you have to have backlinks for your website to rank for a competitive phrase. Um, Google views backlinks as a vote. So basically, if another website links to your website, that's considered a vote in Google's eyes. The more votes you have, the better chance you have of ranking well for competitive searches. Now it's also weighted. So Google likes votes from reputable sources or votes from relevant sources. So if you get a link from a, you know, a university website to your website, that's awesome. You're gonna rank better on Google. Um, if there's some spam blog that links to your website, it's not gonna do anything for you. And 
One way you can do this is local directory listings. This is something that you could start doing today. Um, here's some Google searches for you to use to find these opportunities. Um, you go into these local directories, create a profile, fill out all the information about your business, put your business's name, address, phone number in there, put a website link in there if there is an option to do so and publish it. And that will help your website rank better. Here's an example. Um, there's one called City FOS. I don't know what that means, but this is a very popular web directory. Um, and I built this profile. It took me maybe 10 minutes. Um, entered a custom company description. You can't just copy and paste these into every directory because then it's plagiarism. You have to write a new one. Um, but that is that helps your website rank on Google. Um, part two, if you have any relationships to industry publications, you have a big advantage. Um, let's say you're really good at something that nobody else is, or you have unique industry insights or uh, proprietary data that you can share. Well, pitch a, a blog that you read, you know, like uh, if you read a blog in your industry, write them an email and say, hey, I have this particular insight that I think readers would really like. Can I write about it for you? This is actually a pretty successful thing if you do it for real, you know, if you're not just doing it for marketing. If you have something serious to share that other people in your field would enjoy, um, you can write blogs for other websites and then you'll always get some kind of a bio at the end of something and that'll have a backlink to your website and that will help you a lot. Uh, here's an example. I wrote a blog for something called topmusic.co, um, really popular blog. And at the end, we got a little bio section with a link to our website. Um, that helped us a lot. So that's kind of the game when it comes to guest posting or guest blogging, whatever this is called. It's basically PR. Uh, speaking of which, if you have some kind of a public facing event or you open a new storefront or you do a public concert or you have like a first Friday event, but that's on a different night of the week that people wouldn't know about, um, you know, write your neighborhood blogs. So Fishtown has blogs, South Philly has blogs, everyone has blogs. You can just kind of write to them like, hey, do you want to showcase this page on my website listing an event that is free to go to or is five bucks or whatever? Like, uh, they'll write about it because they need content like that to exist. And um, you'll get a link to your website and it will help you rank better. So now on to local SEO. That's the Google My Business listing. You can do this for free. And if you have a local service, this is probably the most important thing you can have because people need to read reviews. They want to see pictures and they wanna know where your store is or where you're based, right? And that's all available in the Google Maps section. So go to business.google.com, fill out all that information. You have to get a postcard verification. So you put your address in and stuff. Three or four days later, you'll get a postcard from Google. You punch that verification code into your Google My Business dashboard, and then it's, it's live, it's good to go. You can reach out to friends, family, former customers, whatever, to get reviews. And having more reviews helps you rank better in a map pack. And also it just helps people want to call you. Um, so that's a very important thing to do. Also, something called citations matter for local SEO. Those are instances of your name, address, and phone number of the business on other websites across the internet. It's the same thing as backlinking, just with your name, address, and phone number. That helps you rank better in the map pack. Every one of those uh, directory listings that we just talked about, if you find those, you'll put your name, address, and phone number in there. And if those are all consistent across the internet, you will rank better in the map pack. The other thing is that is proximity-based um, in the algorithm. So even if your listing has only been online for two or three months and you have maybe you know six reviews and it hasn't done a whole lot, well, if someone is only a half mile away in Google's such and such service near me, you're eligible to show up for that, even if your website could never rank in the main 10 results in that amount of time. Um, usually my clients' first customers from SEO come from the map pack. So very low barrier to entry there. Content. We touched on this very quickly. Um, on your main service pages, you need to have a lot of content, first of all. Um, like the homepage of the Philadelphia Piano Institute has something stupid, like a thousand words that no one's ever going to read, but Google likes it. Um, so you have to do it. But then you need all those blog posts we talked about, about industry specific material, because that helps your authority online grow and helps your website 
as a whole rank better. So how do you choose these blog posts? Write about things that people are actually asking. Um, I have an example here. Don't write five steps for designing a great website. No one would ever type that into Google. I don't think um, phrase it in a way that a human would actually uh, interact with a search engine, like how to design a fashion website. And then for your video strategy, if you want to do this, you would just make the same video based on your blog script and embed that video on the blog post. And then you have an awesome piece of content on your website that could get traffic on its own that turns into customers. But then also you can show up in the video results and it'll make your website do better as a whole. If you want to start compiling lists of blog posts, use this free people also ask thing. When you Google a question that, you know, you could take your area of expertise, whatever it may be, plug that into Google, just search it, and then scroll until you see this people also ask feature. And then boom, you have four blog post ideas right here, <laughs> if you wanted to. And then if you click those, they expand and show you more. So you could come away after about 10 minutes with 20 content ideas and just pick and choose the ones that you want to write about or if they should be combined into one or whatever. But there you go. That's your easiest content strategy um, research tool right there. And everyone has access to it, but no one really uses it for this. So this is a question I get a lot. How long does it take for SEO to work? That varies wildly. Um, you know, for something competitive, like let's say a law firm wanted to start doing SEO with no background, no previously existing web presence or anything in like Chicago. Well, it would take like a year and a half, right? Of very professional, high-end SEO work. And this happens, you know, and it's a very long-term strategy. But if you're a local business um, that where there is local demand, you could start getting leads from your Google My Business listing within three months, I would say if you do a lot of this work consistently. Um, increasingly, it'll probably take six months or more in a mildly competitive market to start getting leads from those traditional 10 search engine results because you really need to rank in the top five to get any kind of meaningful leads. Um, if it's a competitive thing, it might take a year. Um, and that's just because of what I call web inflation. You know, every day, thousands and thousands of websites are being published. Google only has so many resources and it has to crawl all of these. So it just, it takes a long time. And um, if you're just starting out with no previous SEO um, foundation, you're going to have to do a lot of this with no return for a while. But the nice thing is SEO is one of the only marketing channels with compounding returns, meaning you are going to get more from it over time without investing more money or effort. Um, you all, always have to do something to keep up with it, you know, but like that first year is going to be hard. You know, if you hire someone to do stuff, you're going to have to pay without getting much of a return. If you're doing it yourself, you're going to be writing and writing and writing, building backlinks and all this stuff without much of a return, but then it'll click over time. And then it's amazing because you just have a steady flow of leads that you're not paying for and it can help you plan your business. Um, Google ads is unbelievably expensive right now. <laughs> Facebook ads suck these days. There's just like, there, there's nothing quite like organic traffic for scaling your business efficiently. Oh yeah. And if any of that just didn't make any sense and we don't have time to talk about it here, you can send me an email. Um, I live here in Center City, very invested in Philadelphia. So I like chatting with local people and trying to help them. Local business stuff is brutally hard. Uh, you're probably dealing with, you know, licenses, taxes, customers. So this is probably the last thing you want to talk about. But um, yeah, let's get to some questions. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, let's dive into some questions. I think you made it like so digestible. <laughs> I think sometimes I like, so. said, like <laughs> it's just hard to start. Sometimes we feel like there's so much just staring at you. Um, yeah. But cool. I'm going to go uh, head to our pre-submitted questions first. I see that keep dumping them into the uh, chat and the question, um, the Q&A feature. We'll, we'll try and get to as many as we can. Um, Hopefully all of them. So first question was, other than SEO, what are some other ways that you can drive traffic to your website? Do you suggest online marketing only, or do you add in more traditional types of marketing, such as mailers, placers in magazines, et cetera? Uh, magazines, I would say no. Um, I've had some friends and clients try that, and I've never seen anyone get results. That's just my very small amount of experience. So 
that's not like the truth, but I would do that last if you have like extra money to spend. Um, it really depends on your product. Mailers, again, I haven't done that because I'm a digital guy. I'm sure if you have a product, I mean, it's like TV, right? Like if you have something that applies to literally everyone, like insurance, you can justify spending money on something like that. But unless you have a mailing partner who has awesome targeting, you know, then I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Now, again, if you have a product that like is great for anybody with kids, well, most direct mail providers can send mail to families, you know, so it's there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, for visual stuff, social media is a great option. I'm not the expert on social media. I really dislike it. Um, this is my area of expertise. So mm -hmm. I can't answer that question perfectly, <laughs> but, but no, SEO is not the end all be all whatsoever. Yeah, and just to chime in my own, we've tried mailers before and they're just like, you can't track them. It's, I think we're both digital from the digital sphere. It's hard <laughs> unless you like to put you, a quote on there. Say, it's tough. If you do want to do a mailer or something like that, you would probably want to, first of all, on your web, like on the mailer, put a uh, landing page URL, like such and such dot com slash, you know, August offer or something mm -hmm. so that you can direct traffic directly to that page so you can see if people are interacting with it and looking you up or go to callrail.com or another phone tracking program and, and buy a tracking phone number that forwards to your phone number. And then any call that comes from that number, you know, came from the mailer. You know, that's really what you'd have to do to track the results. Um, this one's kind of a very specific question uh, from one of our members. He recently uh, rebranded um, his small business, um, got a new website, renamed the brand itself, and he's planning on letting previous customers know about the change. Um, but just wanted some advice on telling others about the rebranding. Should he do like a MailChimp blast, an Instagram post, social media, all the above? Is this someone with a pretty serious uh, following online already? I would say it's in web a lot of stores locally um, has like a good presence. People know like his name uh, and his brand. He's got a lot of markets. Um, I would say maybe a medium sized uh, social media following. Yeah, I mean, you would definitely want to let everybody know. You also would want to make sure you redirect your previous website to the new one. Um, Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't do a press release or anything, but definitely let your existing customers know. I think something that happens a lot when this happens is a business just kind of launches their new website and the old one is sometimes just sitting out there in space or doesn't redirect. So if someone visits your previous URL, uh, previous URL and they're like, wow, the site's gone, what happened? You know, so it's pretty obvious, but that's definitely something you would want to do from my perspective. Um, next question. <laughs> when you mentioned to build up good content, what is your definition of good content? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you might have answered this already, but. Not, I mean, not exactly. I, make sure it treats a very um, tight subject in depth. So something that rambles about a lot of different, let me try to come up with an example. Um, this is like, an if you, if you wrote a blog called how to build a good website, you know, unless you're like the New York times, you would never rank on Google for that because it's just so generic. So pick something that really speaks to a core audience and then drill deeply into that. That's my advice. And then as you're writing your content, if you start to go off on a tangent, you know, that's not very tightly related to that title, that's a different blog post, split it off into a different blog post. So what works these days is something that's very in-depth about a narrow subject matter. There are exceptions, of course, but that's a good place to start. Does that answer that question? I think so. Yeah, because it kind of, there's, she had another question um, that might go in line with this. She had said as an artist, so she's a fine artist, uh, she was wondering if there's a way to use, a way to use certain words to attract more qualified I guess leads like art curators, art advisors, uh, to, like a more sophisticated audience. Um, That's a good question. And that kind of is like B2B marketing, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> how do you actually, you're not trying to sell your product to people necessarily. Um, I would say as a subject matter expert, 
don't worry too much about the language. Just write the way that you know your product. You know, that's a good way to cut through the noise online. There are billions of words out there, so much nonsense. Just write about your area of expertise deeply and um, make it understandable, but don't dumb it down too much. And very often the right people will come. Um, I mentioned keyword research tools earlier. Well, you in your head know what people in your industry are looking for, interested in, right? This is what I come across with music all the time because there will be something that's so specific or niched that like Google doesn't know there's, a, there's not enough data for it to populate search terms in these tools. But I know that people are thinking about this because I thought of it, <laughs> you know, as an expert in this particular field. That's something that you could write about online or blog about it. You can also scroll through Kiora or Reddit, one of these like aggregators and just look at discussion forums. You're gonna find little topic ideas all the time that could end up making you money um, that wouldn't have shown up in a keyword tool or just off the top of your head. Um, yeah, it's almost like, I feel like it's the theme, research, but go with your, what you know, as, a, as the maker, as the expert. Um, cool. Are video clips or changing images, I guess in the GIFs, better to use on websites to attract audiences? I think I'm saying versus like images. It doesn't matter. Um, you can use either or. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a big difference because they're both going to have that alt text attribute that we talked about. Like if you upload an image to your WordPress site, uh, whether it's animated or not, um, you're still going to have those attributes that will help it rank on Google. Whatever you think people actually want to see, you know your audience. So if they like animated images, go for it. If they would think it's corny and want just like a product shot, mm -hmm. do that instead. Cool. Uh, so next question, uh, is it necessary to have a reviews page on your e-commerce website in order to get ranked better on Google? No, but if your results have review stars showing in them, you will have a higher click-through rate. So, meaning if you Google a product um, and you see the product carousel at the top, whether you're looking at the ads or you click on the shopping tab and are looking at the organic products, ones that have review stars are going to get more clicks than those without. And this is hard to do because like, let's say you don't have that many reviews or you don't have a sophisticated Shopify setup that allows you, like, like I buy shoes from Kizik. I just buy them every three months. I only wear the same pairs of shoes. And I left them reviews because I bought three pairs of their shoes or four or five or six now. And they send me emails reminding me to leave a review. Well, you probably don't have that yet. So it's tough, but um, over time you will accumulate reviews and that's the main benefit is a conversion optimization element. Like when they're on your website, they'll be more likely to buy if they see reviews. And on Google, you'll get a higher click-through rate because people will see the review stars and think, oh yeah, I want to click on that one as opposed to that one who doesn't have reviews. Cool. Um, it's kind of a long question. So, uh, so hi, we often link to local businesses in Philly. Uh, they're a real estate company, so they, um, Often shout out places to visit, landmarks, et cetera. Um, they also do lots of like local guide blogs, shopping, et cetera. Um, so her question is often will link to their Instagram, they'll often link to their Instagram, but is it better to link to their website? Uh, people these days put all their info on Instagram. So for the ease of people reading it, it seems better, but maybe not for SEO purposes. Are we to clarify, is the, the question the person is linking out to other websites? Or they're getting links from the other websites. I believe it's they're linking to the um, outside Instagram. Um, okay. But I think they're doing as a favor. Like, is it better for that business to then link to their website? If you're the one doing the linking somewhere else, it doesn't matter where you link to for you. You know, it doesn't make it. Mm -hmm. Google won't rank you differently based on if you're linking to someone's Instagram or website. But if someone else is linking to you, you would want them to link to your website um, because that will help your website tremendously. And if you think your website isn't going to convert as well as your Instagram page, either make Instagram very obvious on your website, you know, get the link to your website, but then have an, a big Instagram link <laughs> or work on your website to make it more conversion friendly uh, with maybe some of that Instagram content. Um, so will this PowerPoint be available as a PDF? And I think you're saying you would 
allow us to send it out to everyone. Um, your presentation. Yeah, of course. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a yes. That's an easy one. Um, uh, how much traffic do you think QR codes get? Are they only one-time use URLs? Did you say QR codes? Yeah. I don't know. The only time I use QR codes is when I'm at a bar. Yeah, same. <laughs> so I would, and it, it always links out to the actual website, you know, not a, not like a specific landing page for the QR code. I think Q, QR codes are great. Like if you're at an art show, because I don't have to type in your web address, you know, which is nice. But then, I mean, they wouldn't have any use for the QR code again, but if you have the QR code and let's say I'm at a gallery and I open your website by the QR code, I know where to go now. So the value is recurring even if I only use the QR code once. Uh, great. And then our list. Um, yeah, keep the questions coming. I see the chat is, um, there's some in there. Um, we'll get to those in one second. Um, so if Google ads are very expensive and Facebook ads suck, uh, <laughs> mailers are no good and SEO maybe takes a year, uh, what are we left with before the, that SEO actually takes effect? So this, again, it kind of depends on what you do. You know, if you offer a local service, it's not going to take you a year to get SEO traction. Um, and then also, I, I do passionately hate Facebook, but it yeah. can't work. It's just that after the iOS update, the targeting options aren't that good. So the value of it has kind of plummeted because a lot of people think Apple is going to very soon release its own advertising platform. So they were trying to tank Facebook's platform. Um, but if you, like, if you're selling fine art in the city, there are a lot of people qualified to be customers. So you could do an awareness campaign on Facebook and Instagram and keep it very cheap. Um, you know, you can target affluent families who have shown interest in art before. Just before you do that, make sure you install the Facebook retargeting pixel on your website so that you can double dip on that traffic. If you're gonna pay to send people to your website, you want to gather those audiences by our retargeting audiences, like, you know, define people who are abandoned cart checkouts or, you know, people who visited my gallery page and then left or whatever. Create these buckets of audiences and then show them ads again because it takes people more than one visit very often to buy. Or if you're trying to drum up awareness for an event, that's another one where I could see social media being a good one because people go on Facebook to find stuff to do. And, um, you know, it's not a hard sell. You're not asking them to give you money. So you're just showing your event and they could even have a sign up form. So yeah, it's not a total loss. Google ads is ridiculously expensive these days. Um, shopping ads are very good for super cheap products um, like drop shipping businesses that just try to do 10 million in revenue uh, and make a hundred grand in net profit. <laughs> you know, like that's who's doing well on shopping seemingly these days because there's no friction. Like, oh, it's a $7 product, let's, let's just buy it. But that click costs, you know, 99 cents. So the margins are terrible. Um, for leads, like if you have a service, if you Google music lessons, for instance, you have these huge venture-backed companies, even uh, Virgin, like the Richard Branson company, they have a voice lesson program they're advertising. Well, they don't care how much it costs, you know, but like a local teacher is thinking like, oh my God, I spent a hundred dollars on ads yesterday and I only got one email. Well, that's actually pretty good. <laughs> but if you don't convert these people into students very quickly, you're just burning money. So it's tough out there on Google ads because everyone's spending a lot of money. Um, I think I got away from the original question. Yeah. <laughs> but, I think it was just um, what is worth in addition to SEO, since that is organic and mostly free, like what, do you have any other recommendations? I think when it comes to like marketing and what you should invest your time and our money into. Yeah, well, you can test Facebook and Instagram in small buckets. You know, you could spend $20 and see what happens. It's not gonna hurt you. Um, but then also just kind of like guerrilla marketing in a way, interacting with other people's brands and partnerships I've realized is a very important thing. Like if you can find somebody who has an audience and provide some value to their audience, that could be the cheapest way to kind of hack the growth curve for you. You know, um, it's tricky, but invest in visual media. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and try some Facebook ads. 
it might end up working really well for you. The nice thing is you can turn it off whenever you want. <laughs> you can spend $40 and if you don't like it, turn it off. For leads, the quality of Facebook has just plummeted. Uh, it's mostly junk these days. But if you're trying to sell fine arts, it's visually stunning. You know, if your photography is good, it could end up being successful for you. Cool. Um, so what about hashtags? Do they drive traffic like keywords do? Well, that's kind of a social media thing. And that's a little bit outside of what my focus is these days. But uh, if it's a popular hashtag, yeah, you know, go ahead and use it. But um, I'm not a social media marketing professional. So there's no tie in with Google, if that's the question. Yeah. Like um, there's no, I mean, I suppose people do search for hashtags mm -hmm. on search engines just to see what happens, but that's mostly native to, you know, Twitter, Facebook, whatever. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, like, I would agree. I do, we do social media a lot. Um, hashtags are just for discoverability within that app. They don't want you going like outside of it. Um, cool. Um, just kind of in line with that, what are the prices of the Google or Facebook or Instagram ads currently? So Google, for instance, is a bidding model. So how much you pay for a click is just a little bit more than what the next highest bid is. So if you're selling um, cabinetry services, for instance, you know, and you build a campaign and set your bid at $5. If the next highest bid is, you know, $4.98, you're going to pay $5 for that click. And then kind of assume levels of 10. So a 10, like if you can get your ad to be compelling enough to get a 10% click through rate, meaning 10% of the people who see your ad there on Google click on it, that's pretty good. So 100 views, 10 clicks. And then if you uh, have a conversion rate of 10%, that would mean one of those clicks turns into someone who emails you inquiring about your services. And then your end close rate is completely dependent on your ability to sell or you know, your price, all this kind of stuff, right? So that's variable, but let's say it's 20%. So you need to get 10 leads to sell two jobs. You, know? um, you can kind of work out your own pricing model that way. And then if you set your bids at $5 on Google and realize you're not getting any clicks, well, you might have to raise your bids to like seven or $10 and then the model will just double. You know, So that's one way to work that out. Facebook, um, probably around two bucks a click, you know, depending on your targeting. That's about what I've seen. Retargeting can be cheaper because it's just people who've already visited your website and you're not necessarily competing for inventory the same way. Um, but your conversion rates are going to be very low. So those are kind of ways to think about it. If you can figure out what your average cost per click is and then go by levels of 10, you know, 10% click through rate for search ads, close to 1% for social ads would be pretty good. And then try to get your conversion rate for search ads up to 10%, conversion rate on your website from social media ads to maybe one, 2%, you'd be doing fine. Uh, so if I do custom stuff, but make pieces as examples uh, and as a way to show um, competency, uh, what would be the best way to show those pieces in an effective SEO way? It's a good question. Um, so it sounds like this is not an e-commerce website where people can check out a product on the website, correct? Yep. Well, depending on what the product is, people may or may not be searching for that product online already, but they very well might be. I mean, like there's even people Googling scrap metal sculptures for sale, you know? So pretty much whatever you can make, there's probably someone looking for it. Uh, just make sure that you have a lead form, like I get your custom quote or tell me about what you want. Or you could even have a list of products above the fold. You want people to be able to see your examples without having to look for them on your website. That's probably the best thing I can say from an SEO perspective, because if people click through to your website and then they immediately leave, that's a very bad signal for Google. And it can actually make you rank worse over time. But you want to have above the fold either maybe a carousel of your products that they can see or have a button that says see previous projects before they even have to scroll. That's how you would approach that from an SEO point of view. Cool. Uh, so if you have print on demand products integrated with your e-commerce website, does Google recognize the traffic to the uh, print on demand site or to my own site? 
So the print on demand is not okay. So that's like another website aside yeah. from yours. Well, I mean, I couldn't really say, but if you you could have a page on your website for print on demand services, you know, but it sounds like you're trying to sell their own prints, right? Mm -hmm. And then it takes them, and if someone buys that, it takes them to the print on demand. Well, focus on what you can control, which is driving traffic to your products. And then you can track people who click out to the other website. If you have Google Analytics um, installed with Google Tag Manager, and this is getting technical now, mm -hmm. but if there's a button out to that website, you can track how many people click that button and leave. And um, that might help you get some insight into what actions people are taking. Um, but yeah, you're not, if you don't control that other website, you can't make it rank better on Google necessarily. Um, and if content is not updated or changed regularly, uh, does your website lose standing? Is it important to update your content to remain relevant? Yeah, if it's a subject matter that evolves, yes. Um, like digital marketing, for instance, changes every month. So it's important to go back and look through what's changed in the industry. Um, but if it's evergreen, which is just, you know, it's always the same and it's fine, like it's about practicing piano, you don't have to change that. You'll see a lot of big publishers um, every year they'll go through and revisit all their main blog posts and be like updated 2022, yeah. whatever. I think a lot of the main reason for that is just for click through rate. Mm -hmm. Because if you see that in the title in the search engine results, you might be more likely to click. Um, if it's not something that has to be updated, don't worry about it. But if you think of ways to improve it, definitely go back and refresh that content because it'll help it rank better. But again, if it's, you know, something about history, <laughs> that's never going to change. You know, I wouldn't worry about updating it. And then do you have a recommendation for how many, like, blog posts and how often you should be updating um, your website? It depends on how competitive your uh, landscape is. Um, if you're trying to rank for something and you notice your competitors have 100 articles that are all very good and updated, well, you probably have a lot of work to do. But if you're in something without a lot of competition, it won't take that much to beat them. Um, so that is dependent on what your competitors are doing. Um, I would say start with what you can do. You know, you, you don't need to publish something every day, um, but at least once a month, I think is very important to, because Google, you can kind of train the bots. This is a little bit, you know, esoteric, but like it's just web crawlers on the internet you know, and they learn how often they have to crawl your website to index new content. And if you never publish anything and then you publish one blog post, it can take a while for them to crawl that blog post and start to show it on Google. But if you kind of train the algorithm to index your site more quickly, it, that can happen. So do it fairly often, you know, at least once a month, if possible, if you have time, but you don't need to publish every day. If you have a lot of time and are very motivated to kind of get things moving early, weekly would be great, but never sacrifice the quality of what you're publishing just to get more blogs out. Much better to publish one really good blog post, like a very deep guide on one very niche subject of like a thousand words every month than it is to publish three cheap ones every month. Uh, other than the Google business page, is there anything else that needs to be done for my business with Google? Well, those directory listings that we talked about, once you set up your Google My Business page, and seriously, make sure you fill out all the images, put in all of your business categories, write a good, meaningful description. If you're bilingual, put it in English and Spanish, you know, like do all that stuff because people read it and get reviews. But then once you have that there, those directory listings we talked about, that's how you get your Google My Business listing to rank better in the map pack. So that would be the next thing to do. It's not a Google property, like those are all third-party websites, but you're able to build profiles on them with your Google My Business information on them. And that's very important to get you ranking in the map pack if it answers that question. Also on your website, in the footer of your website at the bottom, put your business name, address, and phone number, like that counts as a citation. Um, Google uses that to map it to your GMB listing and it'll help it rank better. All right, a few more questions. Uh, what would be a good example of using keywords in your title page and header tags 
Uh, this is a tough area to incorporate keywords sometimes. What's a good example of how to like how to write a good title tag? Yeah, yeah. You definitely want to write it for humans and Google. So it takes a little bit of strategy. You have, um, if I remember correctly, 65 characters for a title tag. Um, so because you don't want it to get cut off, you'll see that dot, dot, dot. It actually shows more characters on mobile these days than on desktop, but keep it to 60-ish characters. Mm -hmm. um, like my, for instance, the piano business, it's not very sophisticated. It's just piano lessons Philadelphia with something about teachers or whatever. Like I don't love it, but it works. So I'm not gonna change that. But um, if you're in a competitive field, you you wanna also write it in a way that has, that compels someone to click. Like if you have an offer, you can put that after the keyword or if your business name has your keywords in it, you know, like the Philadelphia Table Company, you know, that's, you could probably just put that in there along with, you know, since whatever year or whatever you want to do that's like marketing language that could compel someone to click. Um, but you need to have the most valuable keyword represented in your title tag. The headers are a little bit different because there are levels of these and they're HTML attributes. So you have H1, which is the biggest heading on the page. That's what Google looks at to see what the main uh, on-page content for that page is. H2s are the second level of header, like the second largest one. Those are for subdivisions for big ideas. H3s just help you divide it further. The best way to think about those is what is a logical way to format this content so that someone could skim it and see what the hierarchy of content is and like could they come away with something valuable from skimming your headings. That's the most important thing is to keep people scrolling through your page. But the title, get your most valuable keywords in there because it's more of a heavy handed SEO optimization that you have to do. I think that answers that question. Feel free to follow up if that if I left that nebulous. Yeah, yeah, I think that sounds good. <laughs> um, okay. So I, I see there's a ton more. I'm gonna take two last ones to do. Um, where do you get the images for your blog videos? Blog, I guess, slash videos. Uh, do you do some light filming, take some pictures, buy stock images? For me, I just buy stock images or use something like Pexels, which is free. Um, if you have custom products, you know, and maybe you have a light box at home, your own photos would always be awesome if you're trying to sell goods, right? Um, and that's kind of what the angle of this talk was for my businesses. I'm not selling physical goods. So my image strategy is a little bit different and it's not as big of a deal for me. But if you're selling tables again, I would try to make them custom to you. You know, I would try to take my own photography, put those on the website. Smartphones these days too, just, you know, they're great. <laughs> yep. um, all right, so last um, question, I should be a good one, but um, it's a good one. Uh, how long do I have to start my website before the business registration process and grand opening of the service? And I think they mean like with the Google My Business stuff, all those directories. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you can build a website as early as you want to, which I think is a great idea because it takes a long time to rank on Google these days. So you can go ahead and get that moving because no one's gonna see it for a period of time long before you open a storefront. Um, as far as Google My Business, you have to have access to the address where the postcard will be sent to verify the business. But as soon as you have access to that, go ahead and do it. Um, again, like unless you're publicizing it on social and you already have followers or something, when a new website is published online, nobody knows it takes a long time for traffic to start coming through. So I wouldn't really worry about, and you don't need a business license or anything. You don't need like a tax ID to set up a Google My Business account or to launch your business website. So go ahead and do it as soon as you can. You wanna get that ball rolling as soon as possible. All right, well, that's all the time we have for today. Um, Adam, thank you so much for all the millions of questions we had um, and kind of breaking it down so well. Um, just want to remind everyone, we will be sending this recording as well as um, Adam's presentation, as well as an article summary. Um, we'll be posting on social media and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, once again, thank you so much, Adam. Um, and thank you, everyone. Yeah, for of course. Time. Thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend.
Cool. Have a good one, everyone. Bye. All right.